Now, this week we are very fortunate to have uh, an invited speaker, Matt Stevens. Um, Matt is a, a statistician by training. Uh, he's, he's spent his career working on a wide array of statistical and biological problems. He trained in Oxford. He did his PhD with Brian Ripley, um, then followed on to a postdoc with Peter Donnelly, where he worked on, a, again, a, a range of different topics, including working with Jonathan Pritchard to develop the still um, widely used approach to inferring population structure, um, at the time implemented in the tool structure, um, and that, that using genotype data. That's a, 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 an approach that is still widely used and occasionally abused to infer uh, population structure from genotype data. Um, as well, Matt worked um, famously on approaches to infer haplotype phase, which is work that he carried on into uh, his, uh, his faculty roles, um, initially at University of Washington and then later at um, University of Chicago. In his more recent work, uh, leading his research team, Matt's group has uh, pursued and made major contributions to a whole number of uh, eclectic fields uh, across human genetics. Uh, these include methods for association studies, a dissection of genetic effects on gene expression, um, in, as, and, and using RNA-seq data as part of the GTEx project and others, um, and exploration, continued exploration of population structure and admixture and other topics. Um, so it's wonderful to have Matt here uh, to talk about um, regression approaches to fine mapping. Um, please welcome him to MPJ. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So yes, I'm going to tell you about uh, some recent work we're unpublished that we're doing um, that takes a new approach to doing what's called variable selection and regression. I'll tell you what variable selection is. I'll tell you about our new approach. Uh, before I start, it's joint work with uh, two postdocs in my group, Gao and Abhishek, and a computational scientist, Peter. And uh, so the motivation for this comes from uh, uh, well, partly, at least, uh, my work on the GTEx project. So this is a picture from the GTEx portal. And, and I'm told that you guys don't need telling to interrupt me, but feel free to interrupt me. Um, so the, this, this picture is for the gene actin3. It's just the first gene that comes up on the portal if you, as, it, as its default suggestion for a gene you might look, like to look at. And uh, along the... Uh, x-axis here are different SNPs, and along the y-axis here are different tissues. And um, the red size of a red blob here tells you how strongly associated is that SNP with expression of this gene in that tissue. Right? So, or, or maybe I shouldn't say strongly associated, how significant is the association, which can depend not only on the size of the association, but the size of the sample in that tissue. So, so um, what you see here is that there's lots of red blobs, which means there's lots of associations. That's the thing you notice. Um, so these, these ge genetic variants that are associated with gene expression are often called EQTLs, or expression QTLs. So we're looking here at a whole bunch of expression QTLs. And the motivation for looking for EQTLs is that if, if a genetic variant affects the expression of a gene that is nearby, then that t might tell you it might be an interesting functional SNP. So what people use this kind of database for is they might have an interesting SNP. They've, they've, they're interested in that SNP for some reason. Maybe they found it was associated with their favorite phenotype. And they want to know, well, is this SNP an EQTL in brain or muscle or whatever their favorite tissue is. So they come to this kind of uh, database and look and they check, is it, oh, is it associated, is, is my SNP associated with expression? And the answer they get is yes, uh, because almost everything here is associated, right? <laughs> so, and, and the important thing to, and then they go away and they write a paper and they say, this is an EQTL in blah, blah, blah. And the important thing to recognize is that, of course, just because something's associated doesn't mean it's uh, causally associated. But actually, there are, we do have ways to get at that question, but we're not really using them. As a community, we're not really using them as, as, as much as we could. And, there's, and, and also, there's some limitations to the existing method. So this is what kind of motivated me is... Uh, we're currently got this situation where people are asking the question, is this an EQTL? And we're getting the answer, yes. And that's true even when there's no real evidence that that SNP is 
having an actual effect in, on expression in that tissue. So just to say a bit more about that, so let's just focus on this strongest uh, line of associations here, which is, happens to be in muscle, skeletal muscle tissue. So what you can see is there's a whole bunch of really big red circles here. So those are SNPs that are really, really strongly associated with, most strongly associated with the expression. And you'll notice that all those circles are about the same size in this case. So the significance of these three guys here is very, very similar. And the reason for that is that those three SNPs are all essentially have the same genotypes in, in the samples. So the association signal that's being measured is the same for every one of those three SNPs. So essentially, we can't distinguish between, between these. When we go down here, this, this is also a kind of a big circle, but maybe not quite as big as this one. And certainly, these are, these are smaller than this one. And the, at least one possible explanation for these associations is that this SNP is also correlated with these three strong SNPs. So if two SNPs are correlated with one another and one SNP is having an effect, then there will also be a correlation between the other SNP and the, and the outcome. Um, so the point here is that at some point, we should become less impressed with this and say, oh, actually, this association we're seeing is really due to the correlation of this SNP with, with this SNP. And probably it's one of these that's really the functional SNP. And, and that's what we want to try and do. So that's what the fine mapping is doing. It's trying to take associations like this and, and in this case, just narrow it down. Ideally, you want to narrow it down to a causal SNP. But as I'll talk about, that can be hard. So what I want to do is instead narrow it down to a set of plausible SNPs and get rid of the ones that really could be very easily explained by the, by the other SNPs. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. So I want to get... You know, maybe I can get rid of these and say there's no real evidence that this SNP is associated with expression once you take account of the other data. <coughs> and ultimately, what I want to do is to do this in 50 tissues simultaneously. So what you can, what you can also see is that the SNPs that are strongest associated in muscle are also, say, often strongest associated in other tissues. And that's not because of this correlation thing. This, that's because there's a lot of sharing of EQTLs across tissues. So things that are EQTLs in one tissue are often EQTLs in another tissue, presumably because of shared mechanisms. And so ultimately, that's where I'm wanting to go to. And I'm not going to get that. So truth in advertising, I'm not going not to get there today. <laughs> but um, what? This work came out of me wanting to write a grant that said we were going to do this, and then sitting down as I write the grant, realizing all the existing methods are too complicated to imagine extrapolating them to 50 tissues simultaneously. And so we really needed to come up with a much simpler way of doing this than, than the existing methods are. So what I'm going to tell you is about is the simple method we came up with for doing things in, in one tissue and with the with the main goal, future goal, being an ongoing work, being to extend that to, to multiple tissues and multiple phenotypes, et cetera. So let's just take a step back. How are these single, uh, how are these associations tested for? So I'm hoping that many of you will be uh, familiar with the idea of testing for association at a single SNP. And this is how most asso genetic association analyses are conducted. They're tested one SNP at a time. So you just take a SNP, You've got, and I'm introducing some notation here, I guess, that Y is going to be, in this case, gene expression or whatever phenotype you're interested in. It could be height or LDL cholesterol or whatever. And XJ here is a vector of the genotypes at SNP J. So J is going to index SNPs. X is going to be genotypes. So this is a simple linear regression of one outcome on one SNP. And so B to J here represents the association between that SNP and that uh, genotype. And I'm just going to assume, for all my talk, I'm going to assume normally distributed, so quantitative traits. You, you know, that, that works for expression. Extending this to binary traits would be an interesting, is an interesting thing that we're interested in doing, but we haven't done that yet. So this, think of E as a normally distributed error. So this is called simple linear regression. 
And uh, the, there are lots of, you know, the, the basic idea is to test the null hypothesis that there's no association. So this is not fine mapping yet. This is kind of the building blocks of what we're going to be doing. So B to J here is the association and not necessarily the causal effect. And um, if you haven't seen them before, don't worry. But the, the, the point here is there's some very simple calculations that people do to fit these models. They compute an estimate, uh, sometimes called the least squares estimate of B, beta. They compute a standard error, and they compute a z-score by dividing the estimate by its standard error. And then they compute a p-value from this z-score and take the log 10 and plot a Manhattan plot. So, that's, so these calculations are very, very simple, very, very quick. And my goal is to be able to do fine mapping using, essentially using these kinds of calculations. So it's going to be the... <laughs> Um, but we're not there yet. Okay, so one one uh, thing in that one single snippet uh, calculation that is kind of equally simple in many ways, but you might be less familiar with, is the Bayesian calculation. So I just want to introduce you to that. And the main point here is that this is also a very simple calculation. Um, but the Bayesian calculation is you, you, instead of computing a p-value, you compute or possibly as well as computing a p-value if you want to get things published. Uh, you compute the base factor, uh, which is a ratio of the probability of y, given that the SNP j is associated, divided by the probability of y to your outcome, given that there's no association. So if this number is big, then the data are much more probable under an association model than under a no association model. So if this is, if this is a thousand, let's say, then the data favor the association model by a factor of a thousand to, to one. That's and uh, the calculations here are essentially the same as that, you know, it just involve things that you've already computed for the single SNP calculations. There's just one thing you have to specify prior distribution on the effect sizes to, to compute the base factor. It turns out to depend on what you assume about how big effects tend to be. So there's one extra thing you have to specify, which is this number here, which you can think of as a kind of a, an effect size that you expect to see. And then there's this, count, this simple you know, numerical calculation. And this form of the base factor is due to Wakefield uh, in 2009. It's very simple. And it's pretty intuitive as well. The thing I'll note, note here is, that, is, is the z-score there is the main thing that drives this uh, thing. So if the z-score is big, then this base factor is big. And actually, so I spent quite a long time trying to persuade people to use these base factors to test for association and had almost zero success, and uh, there are two reasons for that. One is people are less familiar with base factors, but the other reason is it doesn't really make much difference because uh, the base factors are roughly monotonic with the z-scores. So uh, apart from trying different ideas for how you might choose a threshold, the, the associations that come up big on a base factor are very similar to the ones that come up big on a z-score. However, uh, for fine mapping, base factors have uh, a big advantage over z-scores, and uh, we'll, we'll see what that is later. Okay. Good. So you could compute a Bayes factor, and then you could say, oh, it's associated if my Bayes factor is big in the same way as I say it's associated if the p-value is small. Okay. So those are the simple single SNP association uh, computations, and they're all based on what's called simple linear regression. It's called simple linear regression because it's simple, but specifically because there's only one SNP or one variable being associated. So the tool that uh, we need to use for fine mapping is multiple regression. So multiple regression just puts, in this case, P SNPs on the, and sums up over the effects of P SNPs on the right-hand side. So uh, it's called multiple because you're using multiple uh, variables. And the important key difference here is the interpretation of the coefficient b in this model. It's, and I've changed from beta to b to try and emphasize that they're related, but they're, they're different. The idea here is that b is actually the association of SNP j with y after controlling for the effects of all the other SNPs. Right? Because they're also in the model here, because they're also the effects of all the other SNPs that you include in the model are, are in there, when you estimate a B, it's now the association 
after controlling for those other effects. So that means that, you know, with some caveats that I think you just can say, uh, let's ignore those, uh, you can interpret the coefficient bj here now as not just an association, but probably a causal effect. The problem is we're going we're gonna to have trouble estimating it. So that's the, that's the caveat for now. It's gonna, but, but if we knew it, that would be the interpretation of what, what B was, the true value of B in this model. You interpret it as essentially a causal effect, or at least an average causal effect of that SNP on white. Maybe I should have said the X is I'm thinking of coding the genotypes as zero, one, or two copies of, of each allele. So. OK. And just a notation, I'm going to write this model a lot. So I wrote it as a sum over SNPs here. Have we, have we yeah. single variant in no, this, no, in principle, not yet. We are going to get there. We are, but in general, this B it could be non-zero for every SNP. Of course. In principle. Yeah. We're going to get there, and we're going to make an assumption in a minute that there's only one. Yeah. I was going to say, but you're not yet. But I'm not there yet. So now I'm just saying we could try and fit this model. It's hard, but we'll get that done. But if we could fit this model and we could estimate accurately, if we knew the true values of the B, we would interpret them as causal effects. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to try and estimate these, quotes causal effects. Um, and this is just rewriting the, the model in matrix notation. It's just maybe a bit less obvious if you're not used to matrix notation. So I wrote it. This is a sum over J SNPs. And it turns out this is exactly the same. This is just a simple way to write the sum as a, as a matrix multiplication. So uh, to kind of make notation a bit lighter on the slides where, I, where I've written this model down, just to remind you what the model is, it, it's just a different notation. So X now is a matrix, uh, sometimes called the design matrix in a regression context. And each column of X is the, is a sing, is the genotype for a single SNP. So if you're looking at, let's suppose, uh, later, we'll be looking at regions of, say, 1,000 SNPs. So we're going to be, you could look at the whole genome, but that gets harder and harder. So let's just focus on a, a region, maybe a gene, looking at 1,000 SNPs near a gene. X is going to be a matrix where the rows are the people or the individuals, and the columns are the SNPs, and there's going to be 1,000 columns. Okay. And B is going to be a vector with P elements, and each vector is going to be, quotes, the causal effect or the effect of that SNP. So, OK, so one assumption that people often make in this context, not only in the fine mapping, but just in multiple regression in general, is that only a few of the variables we're looking at actually have an association with Y after controlling for the other variables. That is, only a few of these Bs are non-zero. So we could, so a common assumption, and one that might be reasonable in the genetic context, might be reasonable, uh, is that uh, B is sparse. That is, most of the elements are zero, and only a few of them are non-zero. So if it, in that context, it makes sense to start focusing on the question, well, which ones are non-zero? So in the fine mapping context, that's like asking, well, which SNPs are my causal SNPs that are driving associations in this region? Um, it should be said that in many applications, not in many applications of multiple regression, People also select variables, but for a different reason, which is they want to build predictive models. And it turns out that you can do a better job at prediction often by setting many of the Bs to zero. That might seem counterintuitive, but when you've got a lot of Bs, if P is very big, you've got a lot of Bs, you can't estimate many of them very accurately. And so it turns out to be kind of better to just set them to zero than to try to estimate them. So there's this you know, whole set of uh, methods that are really uh, trying to improve prediction. And we're not, I mean, we might be interested in that, but that's not our primary concern here. Our primary concern is actually to say something about which SNPs are having an effect, right? So we're actually interested in which variables we're selecting. We're not just interested in improving predictive performance. OK, so there are, this is a very well-studied problem, and there's a lot of methods out there. So um, I'm just going to quickly mention them, and then I want to try and explain to you why they don't really serve the purpose. That, you know, they don't solve the problem yet. So one approach to this problem is what's called best subsets regression. What that means is you just say you fix an upper number of 
SNPs that you might think you could look for here, say five, and say, give me the best five SNPs. And I don't mean do the single SNP analyses and choose the top five. I mean give me the best combination of five, right? which is a very different thing because if two SNPs are completely the same, there's no point in choosing both of them in that combination. You would only choose one of them. That's so that's what best subsets. So you, you tell it how many you're looking for, and it gives you it, it looks for all subsets of say five SNPs among thousand, and it gives you back what's the best five. And that's a hard computational problem, but um, it, it could be done for five out of a thousand, for example. Or you can have heuristics that work fast to try and guess that. There are penalized regression methods which are kind of variations on that theme. Uh, I won't say any more, more than that. Um, and then there's Bayesian regression methods um, that I will say a bit more about later and which come closest, I think, to solving this problem. Um, okay, so why do these methods not work? Let's, let's have a really, this is our multiple regression model. I'm gonna set up a really toy example that illustrates why we need new methods, essentially, or why the problem's a bit tricky. So I'm gonna assume that there are two SNPs here, X1 and X2, so each, each one is a SNP, right? X1 is equal to X2, that means the two SNPs are just, they have identical genotypes because they're right next to one another on the genome and they happen to be in what's called very strong linkage disequilibrium. They're completely correlated. Okay. So it could just be strong correlation in practice, but I'm just gonna assume for simplicity that they're completely correlated. And then I'm gonna assume that there's another pair of SNPs that's completely correlated. And then all the other SNPs I'm just gonna assume for simplicity are uncorrelated. Of course, that's completely unrealistic, but that uh, is enough to kind of illustrate my point. And then I'm gonna assume that the effect vector B is that the first SNP has an effect that's pretty strong, the second SNP has no effect, the third SNP has an effect that's kind of weaker than the first SNP, and the fourth SNP has no effect, and indeed none of the other SNPs have any effect. So we've got two SNPs here that have an effect, numbers one and three, right? And one has a strong effect, and three has a weaker effect. So the first thing to notice is it's impossible here to, quote, select the right variables, or at least to guarantee you've selected the right variables, because you can't tell the difference between one and two. They have the same genotypes, so there's nothing to distinguish them, at least unless you know, we could go and look, do they disrupt some transcription factor binding site or whatever, but if we ignore that uh, complication for now, we can't distinguish between SNP one and two. So we, even though I've told you here, the truth is that SNP one has an effect, the, the, inference, the only inference we can draw from an association study is that either SNP one or SNP two has an effect. We can't tell which, because they're the same genotypes, at least in our sample. And the same for th three and four. So, Three is the one I've told you has an effect, but it's exactly equal to four, so we can't tell whether it's three or four. So the best we can do here is say uh, it's either SNP one or two, and it's either SNP three or four. So we can make that statement, which is already kind of a useful statement, right? I mean, if you're, if you're a guy, uh, gal, come with, to the GTEC portal and you're interested in whether uh, a particular SNP is an EQTL and actually functionally affecting a gene. If we could give you a list of the, well, one of these affects the expression, we just don't know which one, and then one of these does as well, and actually one of these does as well, that would be a useful thing to be able to tell you. So that's, that's the best we can do, in fact, in this extreme situation of complete correlation. Question? Mm -hmm. Uh, just to clarify, the OR uh, word operator there, do you mean exclusive OR or inclusive OR? Like, what, what is the best that you can do? You, could you make the exclusive OR statement? Or uh, no, you can't make the exclusive OR statement. So that, that would be saying it's one or two, but it's not possibly both, right? That would be the exclusive OR statement. Well, you could say that that's a good, good enough model is one or two, but not both. That right? is what I mean by one or two. Uh, that's a good enough model, but I can't rule out them both. So I mean, I need one or two, but I can't rule out both. I'm not, I'm not by that statement, I'm not trying to rule out both. Yeah, I mean, you can never rule out both, basically. So you can never rule out, more broadly, it's very hard to say this SNP has no effect. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, rule, it, it's like ruling out a null. <laughs> uh, sorry, 
it's ruling out the alternative. <laughs> you know, even if you have a lot of data, all you can say is it doesn't have a big effect, or it doesn't have, it doesn't have even a tiny effect, but it might have a half of a tiny effect. <laughs> yeah. So we can never rule out both, but I, but I, but I, but I also can say that we don't need, but we don't need both to explain the data. But if you're going to explain biological mechanisms, then you're not going to know which one to look at. Correct, that's right. We don't know which one to look at. Maybe both, but, but I can tell you it's one of those. One of them is interesting. I don't know which one, and you could go and do a test for both of them and work it out. That's the, that's the goal. Um, okay, so that's not a very quantitative inference, one or two and three or four, so what would maybe trying to get towards a more kind of general way of thinking about this problem. And I'm going to suggest the following way. I want to, I want to give a set of variables, which here I'm going to define it called a set of variables, a credible set of variables. It's a set that I'm going to say has greater than 95% probability, say, to contain at least one variable j that has a non-zero effect. So that's my inferential goal, is to report as many such sets as possible ideally non-overlapping, as many such sets as the data support that each set I want to make as small as possible. Because I could just report all the SNPs and say, yeah, it's one of these, I don't know which one. That's not much good to you, right? I want to make the set as small as possible, um, but I want it to have a high probability of containing a causal SNP. So that's my, so in my example, I would give you these two sets. The first set is one and two, variables one and two. And the idea, the, the intuition is I can't distinguish between those, but I can give you a set and it, you know that at least one of these is causal and at least one of these is causal. Yeah. So I believe that some studies uh, focused on multiple causal variant fine mapping choose to define a 95% credible set as a set that has greater than 95% probability of containing all of the causal variants. Correct. And would you like to comment on that distinction? Is the distinction important, or why didn't you make that choice? I think that's a crucial distinction. I think that's, um, since you brought it up, a silly uh, definition of a credible set. So the, the definition that's being used is uh, it has a 95% probability of containing all the causal variants. So firstly, I think that's impossible to guarantee under any kind of model because it means you're ruling out that any of the others have an effect. So how do you rule out that a SNP has an effect? I, it could have a small effect. Right? So I think it's an impossible goal to produce such a set. And furthermore, it's not very useful because it, it's typically going to be a big set of SNPs. And all you know is that I don't need to look at the others, but it doesn't tell you which ones of these are kind of exchangeable with one another in a non-technical sense. So I think this is a more, in firstly, I think it's achievable. Basically, all you have to do is find an effect that you're sure of and include enough SNPs to be sure you've included that effect. So I think it's attainable. And I think it's more informative because by giving you multiple sets, each one is, you think of each one as kind of an EQTL, but you just can't tell exactly which SNP is causing that. Yeah. So I think this is an important distinction, yes. And do you wish to produce 95% credible sets that are not intersecting with each other? I do not intersecting, yes. yes. There would be no, re generally there would be no reason to, once you've captured one effect in one of the sets, you don't really need to do it in the other. As it happens, the methods that we've developed very occasionally produce intersecting ones for reasons that I think are uh, to do with convergence to local optima in a surface. And so, uh, it, it doesn't happen very often, but the methods I'm going to tell you about don't guarantee they're going to be non-intersecting. So this is my inferential goal now. Instead of variable selection, it's set selection, if you like. I want to give you sets that have the property that at least one of these variables in this set is likely to be having a non-zero effect. Okay, so existing methods just don't give such sets. So, um, oh, sorry. They, I mean, they don't try to in most cases, so you know, you could argue that's not a criticism, but given that I want those sets. So, so the first two types of method are, are mostly kind of variable-centric, so they're really just trying to choose, say, the best set of variables. So if there are two variables that are completely correlated, they don't really mind which one they choose. They'll just choose one of them, 
and give you it without giving you the option that actually this other variable is equally good. They're not, they're not aiming to look for those generally. The Bayesian regression methods in principle could kind of give you the inference that, um, that, I've, that I've asked for, but they don't right now because, well, partly because of some of the decisions they made, but also because it's actually still hard. Um, so let me tell you about what the Bayesian approaches do in this toy example. So my, what the Bayesian approaches do is essentially look at lots of different combinations of variables and tell you how good is that combination relative to any other combination. So in an idealized situation, in my example, what they would do is they would hone in on these four possible models. So this, this here is the variable, one, two, three, four. I've ignored all the other variables because they have no effect, and so given enough data, the, the, the method will start to focus on these four variables. And then we remember one and two were the same, so you need, uh, so one possible model, and in fact, the, the true model, I told you, was that one and three have an effect. That's what these ones mean here in this table. Var one means the variable has an effect. Zero means the variable has no effect. So this first row here is variables one and three have an effect. And this second row is variables one and four have an effect. And th variable three and four are the same. Remember they're SNPs. SNPs three and four are the same. So these two models are the same. So you can't distinguish between them. And in fact, variables one and two are the same. So all these four models are the same. And they're all equally good. And so they each get, given enough data, roughly 25% probability. I'm simplifying, but this, this is roughly speaking what the Bayesian methods do. You could ask, well, why not include, going back to the question about exclusive, what about 1110? And well, that would have some probability, so that's where some of the simplification is coming in. But usually, if we assume that sparsity, then um, the prior probability on, a, on, the, on the three SNP model that includes both one and two would be smaller than the prior probability on the one and three, and so uh, this would dominate, if you like, depending on exactly the details of the prior. So, so I just want to note that in theory, this contains all the information that we need to create the credible sets. Actually, this, this is exactly telling you that you need either variable one or two, and you need either variable three or four. That's this. But it doesn't really tell you, it doesn't jump out of the page at you, right? Maybe if you, if you go away and think about it a bit, <laughs> you'll realize it's telling you exactly that. It's equivalent to that. That's what's in here. So in theory, this contains all the information we need. So um, I have a, one of my favorite aphorisms is, uh, the difference between theory and practice is that in theory, there's no difference. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. but in practice, there is. And <laughs> so what people actually do with these Bayesian methods is they summarize the, this kind of complicated information by something simpler, which is for each j, for each j, they just ask, well, what's the evidence that that bj is non-zero? So it, what they do is they take, say, for SNP1, how, how confident can we be that the effect of SNP1 is non-zero? Oh, well, uh, it, that happens in these two models, which each have probability 25%. So roughly speaking, we can be 50% confident that SNP1 has a non-zero effect. So that's called its posterior inclusion probability, or I'm going to call it the posterior inclusion probability, or PIP. So it is going to be 0.5. Same for SNP2, same for SNP3, same for SNP4. So th this is the kind of thing you get out of a standard Bayesian uh, fine mapper right now, is these posterior inclusion probabilities. So they're the marginal evidence for each variable. And what, when you look at these, you see you've lost the information that SNP1 and SNP2 were the same, so we can't, you know, it's either this one or this one. You've lost that information. Okay, I'm just telling you it's 50% on SNP1, 50% on SNP2, 50% on SNP3, 50% on SNP4, and you've lost this. It's either X1 or X2 and X3 or X4. So, the, uh, another thing I didn't mention is that the computations are pretty challenging, and they're time-consuming both to run and to code. Um, and going, this is the point I've emphasized, going from the output to simple inferences is hard, and the PIPs are insufficient. So if you're familiar with Bayesian regression already, and you're asking why, why are you bothering with doing something new, uh, I'm trying to solve these two problems, at least initially.
Okay, so this comes back to a question that Daniel asked earlier, which is, well, what if we assume there's only one effect? What if, what if we assume the region only contains one SNP that has an effect? Okay, that's a pretty strong assumption, but the good news is that if we make that assumption, all our problems disappear. It becomes really simple. Okay, so basically, now we're fitting this multiple regression model with this additional assumption that B is what I'm going to call a single effect vector. It's a vector that has exactly one non-zero element. So it's, a, it's P SNPs, say a thousand SNPs. I'm going to assume exactly one of them has a non-zero effect. And all the rest are zero. So it ends up then that I can just compute these posterior inclusion probabilities uh, using the Bayes factors, which I kind of alluded to about half an hour ago. Right? They were very easy to compute. And that's one of the advantages of the Bayes factors uh, compared with the z-scores or the p-values. So let me just tell you qualitatively what's going on here. When you compute a Bayes factor for two SNPs, not only does it tell you how strong that SNP is relative to a null, but it tells you how strong it is relative to another SNP. So if one SNP has a Bayes factor of, I don't know, 10 to the 10, and the other SNP has a Bayes factor of 10 to the 11, they're both very strong against the null, right? But also, the one with 10 to the 11 is quite strong against the one with 10 to the 10. In fact, 10 times stronger. And so its posterior probability is going to be roughly 10 times bigger. Whereas you can't do that with p-values. You, you have this sense that if you've got a 10 to the minus 10 p-value and a 10 to the minus 11 p-value, the 10 to the minus 11 is stronger, but it's hard to know how much stronger it is than the 10 to the minus 10. Can you rule out the 10 to the minus 10 one or, or not? So that's an advantage of Bayes factors over p-values. You do have to add in a, an additional parameter, the, the assumption about the effect size to make this calculation, but you get more out. Okay, so that's what's going on here. The PIPs are really simple to compute. So just to go back to my initial goal, I'm kind of wanting to do this multiple regression model by doing calculations that are just as simple as the single SNP. So this is just as simple. The base factor just comes from the z-score, essentially. So these just are just, essentially what you do is you just do a single SNP regression for each SNP, compute the base factor for each one, and then normalize them. This is the sum of the base factors. And, and that gives you a weight for each SNP. And it tells you what's the probability that that SNP is, quotes, the causal SNP. And if you've got all those probabilities, you can just line them up in order from the strongest to the weakest. And you can go down and you keep going until the sum of them is 95%. And that produces a set that has 95% probability, at least under your assumptions, which you might think were strong assumptions. But under those assumptions, it produces a set that has 95% probability of containing the, the causal SNP. The because there's only one by assumption. OK, so this is actually pretty simple to do. And it's actually pretty useful already. <laughs> because there are like regions which probably do only contain one causal variant. Um, but OK, so sorry. OK, so how does that work in my toy example? Uh, here, here we've got uh, two causal SNPs. OK, well, that's no good. We, we assumed one, so I'm going to change my example. To, to only have one causal SNP to illustrate the idea. And so what happens now is the posterior inclusion probabilities for the two, you know, so now SNP3 doesn't have an effect anymore. Only SNP1 does. We can't tell the difference between SNP1 and SNP2, so they're going to have 50% each. And I'm going to report a set that's just SNP1 and SNP2, and I can't tell the difference between them because they're the same. And if they were, if SNP2 were just highly correlated with SNP1, then maybe this number would be slightly bigger than this one, but they would still be you know, 0 0.6 and 0 0.4 or 0.7.3. And then if you've got a big enough sample size, eventually you'd be able to distinguish between the two SNPs and you'd get you know, 0.95 on SNP1. Yeah, question? So in terms of the big enough sample sizes and the correlation, so we often don't have direct genotypes for these. I don't know whether you're going to get there or not. We have imputation. Yeah. And imputation uncertainty messes things up. And I'm completely ignoring that. <laughs> 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 Just all lumped together as like measurement error effectively in that case. Say again, measurement error. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, it's a good question. I haven't thought much about it. We've completely ignored that. Um, 
and I think we're going to continue to for the foreseeable future. <laughs> so actually, the, a backstory. I spent several years developing methods entirely focused on the idea that we would have to take account of uncertainty and imputations when doing all these uh, analyses. So I built new methods that were going to be fast in order to allow us to take uncertainty into account. And what happened, everyone completely ignored uncertainty and went off and found lots of exciting things <laughs> <laughs> while I was busy wasting my time. So, so I'm not about to rush into repeating that mistake. but. But it is a good point, yeah. It is something to worry about, because you might end up putting less weight on the imputed SNP if you've made errors. As it happens, if they're in really strong LD, you get great imputation, and so that's the kind of reason that I was wasting my time, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Under, under this, this, let's say you do it with a simplifying assumption that there's only one causal SNP. Yeah. You get it. Is there a way to know that you, that assumption is not appropriate? I think it's really, well, yeah, there is. So you could regress it out and look at the residuals and look at the tests on, and we'll get, we'll, we're going to be getting close to that, so actually, in a minute. So that would be the way that people would do it right now, is right, take your best one, map it, or map, and, and then regress it out. So it's going, to come, it's going to come up again. OK, so I'm just summarizing here. So firstly, fine mapping should be viewed as a multiple regression problem. A high LD, that's this correlation between variables, makes it essentially impossible to identify the effect SNPs. I introduce this simple goal, which I think is, although it's very simple, I think it is kind of, I haven't seen people actually phrase it quite as simply as this before, which is I want to report sets of SNPs that have a high probability each of containing at least one effect SNP, one with an effect. And that goal is very easily achieved if we assume a single uh, effect. Um, but if we want to allow for two or more effects, uh, existing methods fall short. And I just thought, you know, that's kind of the background. I'm, gonna, I'm about to start on the new stuff now, but that's, that's the backdrop. So are there any questions before we go to the um, new stuff? OK, so we want to generalize SER here stands, sorry, that's a bit of terminology, single effect regression. A single effect regression is a regression with one, where we assume that there's only one effect. Okay. So we want to generalize this single effect regression, which solves all our problems, but only under a very narrow assumption, to allow for more than one effect. And the usual approach to this in a multiple regression context is to change that assumption from there being one effect to there being more than one effect seems natural. So we're going to take a different approach, which I think ends up really simplifying the inference and yeah, a lot of things I want to simplify, which is we're going to add up multiple single effects. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to change my model to here. I'm, instead of having one B vector that has one non-zero effect, I'm going to have L B vectors, each of which has one non-zero element. So, of course, that, when I add those up, that's going to end up with a vector that has L non-zero elements, unless two of them happen to overlap, which, which I don't rule out, but will have low probability if L is small compared with P, but it could happen. But that's what I'm doing here. Each B L here is a vector, let's say a length of, length of 1,000, because there are 1,000 SNPs, and there's one element that's non-zero and the rest are all zero. And then I've got another vector like that that has a non-zero element somewhere else and another one somewhere else. So I haven't, I mean, I've just done a, di it's a different way of allowing B to have more than one non-zero element, right? By, but by parameterizing the model this way, it's going to end up lending itself to new fitting procedures and, and easy inferences. So I did this not in order to change the model. The model's kind of still the same but to change, to make it easier to fit. I mean, the model's not quite the same, but it's very similar to existing models. And we didn't introduce it in order to change the model because we didn't like the old model. We changed it in order to make it easier to fit. So why is it easier to fit? Well, the key intuition is if we knew L minus one of these, if we knew the first B1 up to B L minus one, and we just want to estimate the Lth one, 
then that now becomes a single effect regression problem. If we knew those, we would basically subtract them out of y, and then we would just do our single effect regression, which ends up just doing single SNP phase factors, <laughs> which is like your single SNP p-values, but just a little bit different, and normalizing them. Right? So of course, we don't know them. So why is this an advantage? Well, um, some people say, uh, uh, one man's vicious cycle is another man's iterative algorithm, or one woman's vicious cycle is another woman's iterative algorithm. So the idea is that as soon as you notice this kind of thing and you're me, you think about iterating between them. So uh, here's the iterative algorithm. So in full, uh, the idea is, okay, you have to start off with some kind of initialization and then you have to repeat things because it's an iterative algorithm and you go through your L's, and at each point you, this is computing the residuals, Y minus the current guesses, if you like, for the other Bs, all but the Lth one, that's this, what this sum is doing. So you remove all the effects except one, and then you use the SER model, the single effect regression model, to, uh, to, to fit the one you left out. So you just iterate through that procedure. You, you pretend you know the others, and you estimate the first one. Then you pretend you know the first one and all the others except the number two, and you estimate number two. So at each point, you're kind of temporally pretending that you know things you don't, but you're iterating. So this is a very common strategy. Yeah? Is capital L less than the number of Great question. OK, so for now, capital L is going to be some upper bound on the number of causal SNPs you want to allow for. So Typically, uh, let's say in a fine mapping scenario, at least in EQTL, say uh, P might be of the order of 1,000, and L might be the, of the order of 10. When you iterate through this procedure, do you, uh, I mean, the PI are supposed to have a property that only one element is on zero, which won't come for free here. So the, you, you then project to zero all the other coordinates except the maximal plus here? No. What do you do? Um, so. Uh, what happens is B has, has one non-zero element, but we don't know which one it is. So we will compute the probability for each one that it's the non-zero element. And we'll keep that around. Yeah. Okay. And then when we're computing this estimate, the estimate will not have the property that there's exactly one non-zero element. It will be what's called a model averaged estimate. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about this algorithm in a minute. Okay. What happens when you choose L that's too big so that you, right. you run out of very you run out of association? Like yeah, so what signal, happens? What's what, the signal that you that you should make L small? Yeah, so what happens is let's uh, let's well uh, yeah, what happens is that the extra one once let's suppose there were really two effects and you choose ten. When it gets to the third one, it doesn't know where to put it, because it doesn't exist. So it spreads it across all thousand SNPs. But well, not all thousand, but most of them. And so basically it says, I don't know where to put this effect you've given me. And you're like, great, OK. So there isn't one. Or if there is, there might be one. I just don't know where it is. So, so that's what happens. So it doesn't, it ends up, if you just look at the, what happens is you get a huge confidence set in, or credible set in the, in the, you know, you get, for the ones that exist and are, and are not only exist but are kind of identifiable, you usually get a small set of very correlated SNPs. And then for these additional ones, you just, it just says, I don't know which one. It could be any of these SNPs. And it might be right or it might be wrong, but it would be useless either way, so you can just kind of ignore them. So that's what we do. So have you formalized the intuition into a model selection procedure? Um, so what I've just said is basically we don't, we don't bother selecting it. We, just, uh, we filter post-fitting out the very big ones. But we actually, a follow-up answer would be we do have an alternative approach which does formally try to prune out the ones that aren't there that I could talk to you about offline. It's not hard, but question? How different are the results if you start with a different thing? Since that B1 is C when you start to calculate the other one, you start to flee that. OK, so these are not SNPs. We are. No, no. B, the, when you initiate B to L, B1 to 0, instead you, you you start with that, you start with B2. Yeah, so uh, the answer is, in the, 
in principle, so this, this algorithm ends up being a hill climbing algorithm. So it, there is an a function it's optimizing that I probably aren't gonna get to tell you, uh, but, um, but that means it can get stuck in a local optimum, but in fine mapping kind of situations, uh, that problem doesn't seem to be too bad. We can set up artificial situations that are not like fine mapping problems where it does get stuck and where initialization ma matters. For the most part, this works very well just initializing from this part and you would get the same answer. Well, I can't say you get the same answer necessarily from a different starting point, but that this starting point gives you a good answer. In other words, uh, close to a optimum, uh, the global optimum. Let me just, okay, so I'm going, I want, for those of you who found this algorithm not quite intuitive, let me give you an analogy. So there's a very simple algorithm called forward selection. So for each SNP, what happens in forward selection is that you do essentially what someone kind of alluded to here, is you do all the single SNP tests, and you pick the SNP that's best. You just test each SNP one at a time, you pick the best one, the one with the smallest p-value. And then you regress that out, uh, you pick the best one, and you regress it out and form the residuals. And then you take your residuals and you do it again. And you keep going until you get bored. Okay. So that is called forward selection. It's, it's a greedy algorithm, right? It's greedy because it chooses the best one at each point. And it ignores the uncertainty in the selection. It just chooses the best one. So what we're doing is what I want to call Bayesian forward selection. I'm sorry, I don't know how to get rid of the, uh, uh, I don't know how to get rid of that. So I won't bother. Um, Bayesian forward selection, you do, you do the same thing. For each SNP, you fit this model, but you could, instead of computing the best one, you compute a base factor, and that gives you a weight for each SNP. So instead of choosing the best one with weight one, you get a weight on each of the one SNPs. So the best one might get weight. If there were two really good ones, you get half each. And then when you compute the residuals, you weight the SNPs. Instead of removing just the best one, you kind of remove a weighted average. So that's what our algorithm's doing, basically. Except this is just the forward part. Then once it gets to L, it goes back to the first one and re-estimates. And that kind of gets to, so I said two problems, if you like, with forward selection is that it's greedy and it ignores uncertainty. So you can think of our algorithm as an iterative version of forward selection, and I think there are certain things already that, that's not new, but which takes account of uncertainty and selection at each stage. So that's the intuition. Yeah. What intuitively is the way to navigate <laughs> that? What I think is a really challenging situation where there are multiple multiple effects yeah. that are in partial LD. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll show you. One that would naively just pick the wrong one. I'll show you. I'll show you. So um, this is a simple illustration. What would happen here in my toy example with forward selection? Well, at the first step, the best one would be either x1 or x2, right? Because x1 has a strong effect, but x2 is completely correlated. So it doesn't know which one to choose, so it just choose one of them. It might choose x1, it might choose x2. It doesn't really care. It will choose one of them, keep that one. And then it will regress that out, and then the next best one's gonna be x3 or x4, and it doesn't know which one. So our algorithm instead, at the first step, it says, could be x1, could be x2, I don't know, so I'm gonna kinda of choose each of them at, at weight half. I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna choose them half, half. Then I'm gonna regress them out, which actually has exactly the same effect as regressing the best one out, because they're the same. <laughs> and then at the second step, it's going to choose, say, I can't distinguish between x3 and x4, so I'm gonna give those equal weight. So what, basically what happens at the first step, it says 50-50 x1 or x2. Second step, 50-50 x3, x4. And we've got the inference we want. You need either x1 or x2, and you need either x3 or x4. Okay, but now I'm gonna come to your, that, that was a simple case. So does it work in, you know, you could imagine it going wrong, so okay. So this is an example of exactly the case. This was a simulated example that we picked out to illustrate exactly what you asked about, I think. So it has two SNPs that are in LD with one another. This is the, this is the two causal SNPs are in red here. And the, black, and, the, and the numbers here are the negative log 10 p-value. So what you can see is that the strongest SNPs, the strongest associations, are not either of the actual SNPs we caused, simulated with a causal effect. And what's happening here is that these SNPs up here are in partial LD with both SNP1 and SNP2. Sorry, both SNP1 and SNP2. And so 
that just happens that they add up to have a marginal effect that's bigger than either of the individual ones. And like magic, uh, this, is our in, this is the result of our algorithm. And I'll show you an animation in a minute to get some intuition. But the point is, OK, there are two confident sets or credible sets, sorry, slip, credible sets identified. Uh, the first one is colored in green, and there are two SNPs in the credible set. And one of them is the actual causal set. And the second credible set contains 37 SNPs, I believe. And they're all in very strong LD, 97% or above. And it includes the causal one. But because it's so strongly correlated with the other ones, it can't tell you which one. But it's one of the 37. OK, you might not think that's very useful, but I think it's actually you know, at least honest. So <laughs> don't know which one. It's one of the 37. And it, it leaves out the, 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 the strongest. And the strongest one does not get picked. Yeah. OK, so what happens? So in the first, so actually we would fit it with L equals 3 here. If you fit it with L equals 2, you would actually get stuck probably, is my guess. But actually, we, by default, we just set L equals 10 for EQGL studies right now. But, um, so there might be actually some benefits to fitting the algorithm with more than you actually believe. But OK, this is it, iteration 1. So just to orient you, the... SNP1 is somewhere over here. It's not this one, I don't think, because it wasn't actually the smallest marginal p-value even close here. But it's, one, it's somewhere over here. SNP2 is somewhere over here. And this is the guy with the strongest marginal association. So in the first, this, in the first, after the first iteration, actually, the red one is the first set we select, we pick up the guy with the strongest marginal association. But then what happens is that in the second, when we fit the second effect and the third effect, we pick up essentially something corresponding roughly to the, to the causal SNP, not quite the causal SNP. So at that point, we've got three things in the regression. And when we go back to this guy, we realize, actually, we don't need this quite so much anymore. Oh, sorry. This is iteration three, and he's gone down quite a bit. Iteration, if we go to iteration eight, it's... Uh, Still kind of hanging around. And iteration 18, it's essentially disappeared. And this is SNP1, and one of these is SNP2. OK, so that's just one example. We chose that example because it's a hard example. Yeah? I think what you're solving here is actually a form of sparse non-negative matrix factorization, where the factors are, um, are your credible sets, yeah. and the sparsity is the association of the SNPs with the credible sets. Yeah. And you're awful. solving it using an iterative solution, which may or may not be the optimal way of, yes. of at getting to a global optimum of the sparse non-negative matrix factorization of the design matrix. Yeah, you could be wrong. Um, I don't think it's the optimal uh, approach. We could always do better. Um, but it's very simple, it's very fast, and it's very effective. No, but I think there are good solution algorithms for sparse non-negative matrix factorization that might actually get yeah, Well, I'd be interested, but um, pretty happy with the current one. <laughs> the last one, it seemed to work well because the second and third effects you picked up and that ended up being kind of close mm -hmm. to the real effects. And you could kind of iteratively find a way to refining it, and then I think realizing you didn't do that the first effect anymore. Is it, are, is it possible the first effect would sort of so throw you off the trail that that, that, that wouldn't have happened? Yeah, I mean, I think it's possible. Um, the only way I have to assess it is through simulations. And that's what we've done. Um, so I don't have theory to tell you this is going to work every time. It's not going to work every time. And in fact, I can put together examples, as I said, where it doesn't work well. And that's where some more sophisticated approaches might really help. Um, where the non, it's a non-convex optimization problem. And my experience is that in the fine mapping case, where the, you know, where the design matrix has a, quite a blocky structure, and um, where there's, it's pretty sparse that this works well. But I can give you examples of different design matrices where it's a really hard optimization problem. And so there, you know, it could be interesting to look at better answers. Yeah. Have you explored in simulation something sort of intermediate between what you're doing and what that suggests, which is simply running it several times with different initializations, 
doing just doing feature busters? Um, so in the hard cases, we have experimented with whether better initializations help. And the answer is yes, or they can help, and it can be hard to find a good initialization. Um, in this case, we haven't experimented greatly because it already works really well. Yeah. yeah. You said it climbs some function that you're probably not going to get to tell us. Well, yeah, the more questions you ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a variational approximation to that model. Yeah, the, the short answer is it's, it's optimizing a variational objective function for that sum of single effects model. And in fact, that's one slide at the end. So now I have told you the answer. I mean, I wasn't going to say any more than that. So, any other questions? I mean, all I've got left is simulation results. So it, it's going to kind of just to kind of try and convince you that it kind of works. So we simulated data. We took we tried to mimic an EQTL study. So we took GTEx genotypes from one tissue. I'm so, oh, well, actually, GTEx genotypes. Uh, it doesn't matter which tissue, because uh, we took 574 individuals, so it was kind of an earlier release of the GTEx data, and we selected around 1,000 SNPs near each gene. We took about, I think we took about 200 genes here, just to get a representative set of Xs. And for, we then varied the number of true effects in our simulations from one to five. Uh, and then we compared with these uh, Bayesian methods. So fine map and caviar, well, fine map kind of does a stochastic search uh, to try and find good combinations. Uh, Caviar does exhaustive search over all subsets of one, two, three. Uh, we stopped at three for Caviar SNPs. And DAPG does a stochastic search, also a different stochastic search. Um, and DAPG is the only one of them that comes close to uh, providing the kinds of set that I talked about. They didn't call them credible sets, but it does provide you some sets that they call signal clusters. So we're gonna compare our sets that we get out with, with DAPG at the end. But first, uh, so the other methods don't provide that kind of set. They provide a different kind of set. But um, So first, I'm just going to compare them on what's called the PIPs, the posterior inclusion probabilities. So these are the things that I said actually lose quite a lot of information in some sense. They're not everything. But all the methods compute these, so it's kind of useful just to at least compare what they look like. right? So each plot here, let's just orient you. Uh, the uh, y-axis here is the posterior inclusion probability from our approach. We call the model SUSY for sum of single effects, so SUSY. Uh, and the y-axis is for DAPG. And this is the simulation with a single effect. So there's only one effect. We didn't assume only one effect when we fit the model, but the simulation only had one effect. And so what you see here is that mostly it agrees, but occasionally DAPG assigns a high ish posterior inclusion probability to a SNP that Susie assigns essentially zero. And the colors that you can't see very well, I don't know if we can go the lights, but there's red and black here. The red ones, or dark red and black, the red ones are the causal SNPs. They're mostly up here. Uh, so they're the ones that in the simulations actually had an effect. And the black ones are the ones that did not. So you can see all these ones that DAPG is picking out as having moderate PIP. Or maybe you can't see, but I can tell you that all the ones that DAPG is picking out here are actually black, which means they didn't have an effect. So it's a, and I think it's just a failure of its stochastic search to sometimes, you know, sometimes the stochastic search just ends up assigning too big a PIP. Uh, that doesn't happen with Caviar, for example, where, which does exhaustive search, and it doesn't happen so much with fine map as it happens either. So this is fine map. You can see that when we simulate with two effect variables, or three to five effect variables, that the agreement is less good between the methods. I should emphasize that these methods are all fitting slightly different models. So they, they're all similar, very similar models. They're all based in approaches to multiple regression, but there's various things like your prior parameters and different things like this, as well as potentially uh, computational errors. You know, they're, they're approximations, right? So, there can be errors in the approximation. There's going to be different. So in other words, the differences are partly potentially due to, quotes, errors in the approximation and also potentially due to differences in the models or the underlying assumptions. Actually, these, these are closer in agreement than it might look initially to your eye because a lot of the stuff is down here where you know, the two methods in each case are assigning very, very small posterior inclusion probability to almost everything. 
because it's a very sparse thing. So, and if you compute these correlations of these PIPs, they're, they're all greater than 90%. But your eye is drawn to things like this, right, which are variables that one method assigned a high PIP and the other method assigned a small PIP. And if you look closely, sorry, I don't think you can see the colors, but all these guys are black and some of these guys are red. So what that says is that when, when, the, when things differ between the two methods, the SUSY PIPs tend to be, the high SUSY PIPs, low other, tend to be the actual simulated causal SNPs, and the other way around often is non-causal SNPs. So again, this might be a failure of the, it might be a modeling difference, but I suspect it's not. I suspect it's a failure of the stochastic search to actually adequately explore this. And this is just kind of plotting an ROC curve based on the PIPs, which I don't think is that relevant, but just to quantify that notion that the, P, the large PIPs from SUSY, this is power, this is, you know, if you threshold the PIPs, what proportion are actually causal SNPs in our simulations versus non-causal, and these are basically different thresholds, and the SUSY line is the red one, it's above the others, at least most, mostly. That's just formalizing that notion. And so this is comparing the sets. So now I, you know, I've made modeling assumptions, and I've computed these sets that come out of the method. So maybe I, I glossed over it a little bit, but at the end, what you get is L credible sets, one for each of those effects, for which one is the non-zero element in that vector. And we th some of, as I mentioned in an answer to a question, some of those sets contain huge numbers of SNPs that are not correlated with one another at all. And we just, so we filter out the very big ones that, that contain most of, you know, 800 SNPs. It's not a very useful, credible set. So we throw those out, and we keep the ones which are uh, smaller and contain highly correlated SNPs, you know, the ones that intuitively are capturing an effect um, of SNPs that are very correlated with one another, say greater than, actually we keep the ones that contain SNPs that are more than 25% correlated, I think. So it's a pretty uh, pretty uh, light threshold, but it doesn't actually matter where you draw that threshold, because actually the, you know, all the sets either contain completely uncorrelated variables or almost completely correlated variables, and there's very few in between. So, Okay, so that's a detail, and I asked the question, well, of these sets that I'm giving you that I say I have 95% probability, which is a probability computed under my modeling assumptions and according to the approximation we're making. But I'm giving you these sets and saying these have 95% probability to contain a causal SNP. What proportion actually do? So that's what this, this is called coverage. So that's what this is plotting. And it, we're stratifying by the number of effect variables here, one, two, three, four, five, and we also did some simulations with 10 effect variables here. And the red line is, sorry, the red dots are SUSY, and the blue ones are DAP, because it also gives you some sets. And this line is 95%. So SUSY is going between, it's down to 92% here, and above, like, 97% here. So what's, depending on the simulation scenario, those sets that I'm giving you that I'm saying I'm 95% confident it contains something, between 92% and 97% of them do actually contain a cause effect. Um, actually, there's no way of guaranteeing 95%, because if I did simulations where there were no effects whatsoever, then every set I give you would contain no causal variable. It would have to, right? If I did simulations where there was nothing and apply the method, it would eventually give me some sets, and they wouldn't contain a causal variable, because so there's no kind of way of guaranteeing 95%. So these 95% are under a modeling assumption, and so, you know, and one of the modeling assumptions is that there's something to find. Um, okay, so what you can see is DAPG also isn't too bad. Its coverage is above 88% or 86%, 87% somewhere, but always below SUSY, or they're, they're similar here in the one effect case. And then you could ask, well, what else should I ask about these sets? Well, one thing is you could ask, well, how many of my actual causal SNPs were in a set? Because I'm reporting these sets as kind of discoveries. 
So of the sim simulated effect, uh, effects I included in my simulations, how many did I find? And of course, that's going to depend on the simulation scenario, how big the effects were. So you know, the absolute numbers here are not that interesting, but this is a relative comparison between the DAP sets and the SUSY sets, basically. And you can see that uh, the red dot is always above the blue dot. That means that we're finding set more, more of the true signals are included in the set. This is the size of the set, so you'd like the sets to be as small as possible. So this is how many variables are included in a set. So it's going, the median, that's the median across simulations. So you can see that with the patterns of, so these, this is kind of interesting. So this is pat, with realistic patterns of LD, if you choose one to five effects, let's say realistic patterns of LD, how many variables do you tend to include in one of these sets typically? And the, the numbers here, well the median's going from three to 10 or so. so that gives you an idea for how much we can narrow down maybe EQTLs, uh, you know, about half of them can be narrowed down to, well, less than seven SNPs or something in these simulations. When we go to multi-tissue analysis, I expect to be able to do much better. But. So again, uh, the red dot is now always below the blue dot. That says all the, the sets are smaller from our method on average than the sets from that. So we have better coverage, we have more power, we have smaller sets, and the last thing is the average R squared of the SNPs included in the sets. So, and they're higher than, than DAP. So we're including SNPs that are kind of more proxies for one another. Uh, Runtime, I mean, it's fast. So uh, it's, the computation's linear in N, P, and L. Or if you, uh, if N is really big, you can make the runtime P squared L after an initial NPL computation for those of you who care about it. So if you're doing UK Biobank, we could do an initial computation that used N, all N individuals, and then we could reduce per iteration runtime to P squared L. So you could look at a gene in Biobank and do the calculations quickly. Um, so with caveat the exhaustive search? Yes, no, yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think this was for looking for all subsets of size three. But that's still, you didn't, um, you showed one comparison, but not a comparison on, you only compared with DAPG on your previous slide, I guess. Does caveat actually do better under certain circumstances with a <coughs> exhaustive approach? Uh, than? Than Susie. Well, it uh, doesn't here. Yeah, yeah okay, that's no. good. Yeah, right. So there's no point where the exhaustive search is actually No, good. and so, okay, one of the things that Caviar is using the Z scores and not the raw data, and there is some approximation going on there. So that could be part of the answer. The other thing is it fixes its prior effect size to a value that may or may not be sensible for our simulations. I mean, obviously, I mean, if you look at, yeah, the agreement here is pretty good, right? So it's not. It's not like we've chosen a really silly set of simulations that it just doesn't work on. It, it, I mean, really, I th actually, although it might not look like it, I, I think of this as just a sanity check to say, yeah, they're all kind of producing pretty similar results. And, and even this, really, the real gain is the sets and the speed. Yeah. And so this was just what are we actually doing? We're optimizing a, a variational objective for those of you who know what it means. So we're basically computing an approximation to the posterior distribution on those L effects, L single effect vectors. And so what the important thing here is that we're factorizing over L. So sorry, I'm gonna get technical to people who know about variational approximations. Just a side note to them. We're factorizing over these L, but these do not factorize over the P SNPs. So each of these QL is a distribution on a P vector that has exactly one non-zero element, which is a super simple distribution even though it's in p-dimensional space. So that's why our method is very different from previous variational, that you know, there are variational methods for fitting multiple regression, but they factorize over the p-snips, and, and that's a bad approximation when there's LD. So in fact, those methods are completely useful. I mean, we came up with some of them. They're useless for fine mapping because they just choose the best. They choose a, a set of good SNPs and stick to those. They don't give you any uncertainty. Yeah. 
So that's a side note. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically done, so uh, let's see. This is what we want to do next. Uh, so I mentioned Caviar and FindMap. Maybe I didn't mention FindMap, but Caviar and FindMap are running just on that you do the z-score computations, and then you give it to them together with an estimate of the LD matrix, and they run with those two things. Uh, so that can be a useful thing to do if you only have the summary statistics. So you can do a similar, we haven't, well, we haven't fully convinced ourselves we're happy with all the details, but we have a preliminary implementation of that. Uh, definitely it's going to be possible to do whatever they did with z-scores, we can, we can do with z-scores. There's some approximations going on there that are a little, little un I'm a little unsure uh, how to best make those approximations. Uh, We'd like to do logistic regression. And what I really want to do is multi-phenotype or multi-ethnic or multi-tissue or multi-whatever you want, fine mapping. So in the GTEx data, we want to do mapping across all the tissues simultaneously. In the UK Biobank, we want to fine map all the thousands of traits simultaneously, maybe. Uh, we might like to map the same traits across multiple populations simultaneously. Yeah, we want to do anything you've got. It doesn't have to be the same phenotype. It could be different phenotypes. Or it could be the same phenotype in different conditions. Yeah. So in the summary statistics case, I'm, I guess you'd also need an LD estimate yeah. or yeah. either for reference L or N samples. Yes, and yeah. I mean, that's, that's the trade-off that all these methods make is that you can work with summary data, but you have to have some estimate of X transpose X. And if it's a bad estimate, it's not going to work well. So we know that heritability is not equally distributed across the genome. Uh, the what? Heritability, yeah. Right, so have you considered using um, estimate from partition heritability as prior yeah. in your model? And, and some of these fine maps, you may to use that. And yeah. are you in favor of those? Or who's, who's um, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I've done some of that stuff myself. Um, I think most of the annotations don't make that much difference ultimately. You know, you know, it might be a factor of two or a factor of three enrichment. They tend not to be a factor of 10 and certainly 100, you know, I guess. So, so I tend to think that there's less benefit to incorporating those annotations than, than maybe uh, we would like. But, uh, you, but there's a benefit and you can do it. And it's not hard actually in this. So, I know some people have expressed to me they prefer to do it without the annotations and then go back afterwards and look at the SNPs and well, that's there. I, I, I don't have a, I can see the appeal of doing something unbiased and then going back, but that you also run the risk of kidding yourself that way, right? So, um, yeah. Short answer is I think it's, I think it's a useful thing to do. It wouldn't be hard, but I don't think it has anywhere near the potential benefit as the multi. You know, looking at 40 phenotypes simultaneously, well, certainly across 40 tissues where there's a lot of sharing of EQTLs, you essentially start to multiply your sample size by almost, well, maybe not 40, but many, many times bigger. You really increase your power to find things. So, so I'm more interested in that, but that is harder than what you just said. Yeah. Yeah. At the practical level, so uh, in terms of the locus definition and, not, and the size, do you just feed in a, a set of SNPs until the LD decays, or how, how does one, what are the, what, what's your... What yeah, I don't think, um, I think it's an open question. Yeah, I mean, that's what we have in mind is, pro well, probably what I have in mind for GTEx is just to take a cis window of some fixed width and, and run the thing. Um, so more based on distance from the TSS than on LD, just because we know most of the CIS EQTLs are pretty close. In principle, you could run this genome-wide, right? Um, I mean, it's linear in P. So in principle, you could run this genome-wide. It, uh, it would be doable for, well, maybe not for UK Biobank, but uh, maybe, I don't know. I mean, yeah. As you think about these multi-phenotype approaches, is it more on the, on the assumption of shared effects across phenotypes, or is, is there a space of more complex things where you can drop power when effects are shared, but still have the flexibility to recognize things that are not? A great question. That's exactly the kind of problem we're interested in. Uh, as an advert, we have a paper out in Nature Genetics three weeks ago that does 
tackles exactly that problem, but not in the fine mapping case, just in the marginal association case. So the plan is that we will combine the work I've just talked about here with that approach. So if you're interested, the first author is Sarah Herbert. Yeah. Does the prior variance matter, and if so, how do you set it? Great question. Um, what we did in the simulations was just set the prior variance to something that's kind of not too, you know, we fixed it to something that's about, uh, well, it was point 0.1 of the variance of the Y, which is kind of, roughly speaking, 10% of the variance explained, saying that the, each effect has, we expect roughly 10% of variance explained on average, which we think for EQTLs is kind of a reasonable starting point, and we've run it with point 0.2, point 0.4, and point 0.05, it doesn't matter much. We can also estimate it. And uh, so, actually, let, let me just do this, and then I, if we still have time, I can say how we estimate it. But, so we have an R package, if you're interested. I expect a preprint to go up before Christmas. Uh, I, I expect. <laughs> uh, if I weren't here, it would have been done by now. <laughs> and um, I want to thank, as well as my co-authors, I want to thank Yu Chin Zhu and Kai Chin Zhang, who've done some coding work on the package, and also my funding, NHGRI and Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I'd be happy to answer more questions, but just to answer, you know, this is the gruesome details <laughs> of, of all the model. So you can see that each BL here this is the prior on the effect size. So BL, this is, you might not be able to see it, it's not bold. So this is the non-bold, this is a scalar of the effect size of the non-zero element, the prior, the effect size on the non-zero element of the L effect. So it's normal zero sigma squared zero L here. So what we can do is we can either fix this guy to be the same for every effect, or if you wanted to, if you knew what it was, you could affect it as, assign it separately for each effect. Or what we can do is estimate this by maximum likelihood, or actually by, by maximizing the variational lower bound over each of these parameters. So that, that's what allows us to esti effectively estimate L. What happens is if you have some effects that just don't really exist, so if we have data with two effects, and I fit L equals 10, come back, then many of these estimates will be zero. It's a little bit like, for those of you familiar with Automatic relevance determination, it's a bit like that idea. It's, I mean, it's empirical Bayes, essentially, but yeah. So that, that's, that's the old, you can either fix it to something sensible, or you can estimate it, and that will do some kind of estimation of L for you effectively as well, yeah. I think we probably have time for one more question, if someone has another burning question for Matt that wasn't already raised. Um, if not, I think we asked tons of questions during this talk, so please join me in thanking Matt very much for a wonderful presentation.